If you watched my last video on this topic, the one that I just released about a week ago, I really thought that was the end of the story. In that video, I speculated that Lynn's departure was over creative differences, which turned out to be true. No surprise there, really. I'm not surprised, mother <laughs> But more information came to light, and what we learned was a big surprise. I'm gonna get to that right after the break. Did you know that the average driver gets nine traffic tickets in their lifetime? Look, I'll be the first to admit that I've taken maybe a couple of liberties with traffic laws back in the day. And of course, when I got caught, I had to go to court to fight the ticket, which was always a hassle. And each time that I lost my case, it meant big fines, points on my record, and higher insurance premiums. Eventually, I realized that nothing beats having a good attorney argue your case in court. So here's what you do. You download the Off The Record app to your phone and register for an account. And if you get a ticket, simply upload a photo of your ticket into the app and you will be quickly matched with a lawyer in your jurisdiction. Your lawyer will start working your case right away and in most cases, you'll never have to set foot in a courtroom. Off The Record has a 97% success rate and a 4.9 star rating on Google. And guess what? They even offer a money back guarantee if they aren't able to reduce the points or keep that ticket fully off your record. Best of all, I've arranged a 10% discount for all of my YouTube viewers. So download the app and register using the referral code FASTLIFE to receive 10% off your first case. After my last video on this topic, I thought I was done talking about this nonsense, but an in-depth piece on the conflict came to light the day after my last video dropped, literally the next day. And I was like, oh my God, here we go. It's actually important to understand what went down. So here I am again to explain it to everybody in a little more detail. I'm going to go over the newly released details that we learned about, but I want to be clear that with the franchise like this, the main thing is that whatever tensions, disputes, and personality conflicts exist, universal and the production team deserve great credit because they've made this franchise into a seven billion dollar property and let us not forget there's people still following this to this day 20 years later but sooner or later there was bound to be some friction right all families fight from time to time right and rich families aren't exempt from that you ever see the kardashians and when you mix in some egos, a bit of narcissism, tight deadlines, huge financial pressures, the challenges to try to up yourself and last minute changes, there's a good chance that there's gonna be some tension eventually. In the last video I did, I spoke about these tensions and specifically the allegations that were previously aimed at Vin Diesel that he was showing up to set late, he didn't know his lines and he wasn't in shape, meaning that he was not in his best physical shape. Accusations that were made years ago by Dwayne Johnson during their feud after Hobbs and Shaw. So. Maybe there's something to that. But this latest beef revolves more around Justin Lin's frustrations, which apparently were many. Justin Lin was actually handling the writing duties on this movie, and he believed that the script was locked in. It was done. Good. Ready to go. Let's go over to England and start filming. The first changes came when a key location in Europe had to be cut from the movie because of the war in Ukraine. Okay, not his fault, not Vin Diesel's fault. It's Putin's fault. Then there was still the issue of casting for one of its villains. Apparently they were going into the movie as of two weeks ago without one of their master villains. Lynn then, growing frustrated with these last minute issues, was further aggravated when the studio announced that it would be sending a writer over to Europe to polish the dialogue for some of the scenes. Justin's sitting around there going, wait, I thought we were done. I thought this was all locked in. All of these changes were really starting to weigh heavily on Lynn, apparently. Then on April 23rd, Lynn and Vin Diesel were in a meeting with two other unnamed individuals. Vin Diesel presented new notes, presumably with more changes that he was trying to promote or get pushed through. And I think that at that moment, whatever discussion took place in that room ended with Justin Lynn saying, this movie is just not worth my mental health. And he walked out of the meeting and with the door slamming behind him. Not good. <laughs> No, 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 no. A Universal spokesperson soon said that any creative differences leading to Justin Lin's exit were with the studio, not with fellow producers, cast, or crew. There was only two other people in the meeting. <laughs> So who was pushing what? We don't know. However, a new report alleges that Vin Diesel's troublesome on-set behavior is the real reason that Lynn quit Fast 10. As per Richard Johnson of the New York Daily News, he said a source familiar with the situation described Vin Diesel as difficult. That's a politically correct term for uh, a pain in the ass. <laughs> 
But even if Justin quit in the heat of the moment and left the door open, kind of, sort of, the studio took him exactly at his word, and two days later, Universal and Lynn reached a settlement. Lynn would remain as a producer for Fast 10 and presumably Fast 11, but it looks like he's going to lose out on a 10 to $20 million payout from stepping away from being the director role from Fast 10, and he won't be back for Fast 11 either. Clearly, Lynn had good cause, at least in his mind, to walk away. If you're giving up 10 to $20 million, you're like, you're done, bro. You're just like, done, done, done. I'm done, I'm done. To keep the movie crew from abandoning ship and going off to work on another movie, Universal was paying somewhere between $700,000 to a million dollars a day just to keep the production moving forward and to keep all those people in place. They didn't want to have to go out and recruit new people. To his credit, Lynn, ever thoughtful of the repercussions if that happened, he actually told his crew members that were loyal to him that they should stay on the movie and finish it. But they would have to scramble to find a capable director. How do you just hand the reins over from Justin Lin just to somebody else? As I said in my last video, I thought Universal would probably be approaching former director F. Gary Gray, and they did. It seemed like he was a first choice, but he was not available as he was shooting a Kevin Hart movie for Netflix, I think it was. Any movie with Kevin Hart's gonna be a short movie, right? <laughs> Instead, they snagged a guy by the name of Louis Letier, who is no stranger to car action movies, having directed the Transporter movies with Jason Statham, and clearly this guy knows how to make car chase movies, so I'm on board with this fellow. But I wonder if he has any experience launching plastic Pontiacs into low Earth orbit. Maybe I'll have to brush up on that. <laughs> I'm sure Vin Diesel will teach him how to do it. The biggest revelation from this news report was the confirmation of one of my theories about the franchise. I've been saying this for a very long time, uh, basically saying I don't understand these open-ended storylines, these seeming random incongruous scenes. They're going from one stunt thing to another with nothing to fill it in. How do they get there? Why are they there? That kind of stuff. Essentially, that article says the writers in the previous movies would be writing action scenes. They bring them to Vin Diesel and he'd say, yeah, man, let's do it. Or if no, and let's not do it. But if Diesel agreed to do it, it would be the director's job to make it fit within the script. So all it is is a bunch of gags, right? With and they have to string it together. So I feel bad for the writers. What that means basically is what I've been saying for years. Basically, screenwriting goes like this. They're sitting in a room smoking a fat one and just go, you know, it'd be cool, man. Let's put a car in orbit, dude. I'm not knocking the process at all, really, because these movies have made close to $7 billion. So clearly they're giving audiences what they want because they keep coming back. So how can I complain about it? And again, I am not the target audience of these movies. But it's just kind of funny how it's done off the cuff. But frankly, I, being honest, it's pretty impressive that this unconventional process has produced a successful 20-year franchise. Although I will point out there, nobody's walked the stage to get an Academy Award. <laughs> So there's that. But this also explains why the plot has had so many holes, so many weird things. Some of these movies jumped around going from one time period to another one. Somebody dies. No, they're not dead. They go to their funeral, but wait, they're not dead. They blow up in a car, but they're not dead. But they come back years later, and then we they see the backstory four more years later. Oh, what's going on? There, what's going on there? But based on the history of directors who have come and gone, it's not surprising that the script writing process is a bit unorthodox, nor is it surprising that the, there might be real conflict among some people at the top of the crew, especially when you're trying to write a script piecemeal and it's just hard to what top yourself over and over and over again. But you might be surprised to learn that Justin Lin had stepped away once before. I don't think a lot of people realize this. You remember he, he directed uh, Fast and Furious Tokyo Drift, right? But after Tokyo Drift, he went on to do four four and five, but he passed on Fast 6. He cited franchise fatigue after directing all those movies back to back to back. It was already wearing on him back then. Who knows if Vin Diesel had anything to do about that. But in total, Justin Lin has directed five of these films and is the only director to direct more than one of these movies. He was also set to produce the last two films, Fast 10 and Fast 11. That looks like, as it stands now, that that's not going to happen. So I don't doubt that there's frustration at the top. You work with somebody long enough, and it becomes tiring if you're not on the same page and people change over time, or sometimes they don't, or maybe that's one of those reasons. Somebody changed, somebody did. But it seems like Justin Lin is more methodical and organized and Vin Diesel kind of works in his own way, maybe, uh, you know, I don't know how to say it, but without structure, but more of a loose and casual style of doing things. And that sometimes doesn't sit well with a crew who works methodically and with a lot of structure and they map it out, they're doing everything they're supposed to be doing as a director. It's also quite possible that after many years, frustrations have just simply boiled over. Maybe these two people have been arguing a little bit or have find a way to resolve it e easily. 
but who knows. But in a very public spat, Dwayne Johnson complained about Vin Diesel in a similar light, posting some sharp criticism about his work ethics being late on set, and went on to accuse Diesel of having a diva attitude. The dude has made how many movies? Seven, 10, 15, 15 movies? I think he has the right to have some ego, but was that too much? I've had a total of three personal interactions with Vin Diesel, and each he seemed jovial, approachable, and enthusiastic, but I never had to sit in a script meeting or a creative meeting with him, so, and I certainly wasn't keeping track of what time he was supposed to be on set, so I'm really in no position to speculate whether any of these allegations are true. Based on the evidence, it seems like that's the way it's being perceived by Justin Lin, and there probably is some truth to it. But for Justin Lin, these accusations were true enough for him to walk away from a 10 to $20 million payout. You don't do that just because you didn't get a, you thrown a temper tantrum. It seems to be something more. So what's going to happen next? Hard to tell, but I'm going to make some predictions. Here's what can we, we can expect. Another wild set of action shots, thinly stringed together by a weak, illogical plot, a complete disregard for physics, chemistry, gravity, and reality. In other words, another blockbuster hit, one that feeds on its teenage audience's ticket revenue. And it should be a great success, box office wise. You have to remember that the audience that made this franchise a hit 20 years ago have long abandoned these movies because the continued departure from the franchise's street racing roots and the wild action sequences that have replaced it. No matter though, because the audience is now 20 years older and Universal is certainly not making Fast and Furious movies to attract people who are in their 40s and their 50s. So we all have to remember that. And as that audience left the, the franchise, you have to remember that Fast 7 came out in 2015 and it raked in $1.5 billion. First Fast and Furious movie to make a billion dollars. But Curious Minds wanted to know how, how this happened. CNN and other outlets also took notice of how this movie seemed to appeal to such a broad audience across multiple demographics. And it's something that typical superhero movies of that era could not accomplish. So everybody was looking into it. According to the studies by these news organizations, the film's audience was one of the few American blockbusters which had a majority non-white makeup. And when they dug further, they found out that 37% of the filmgoers were reportedly Latinx. 25% were Caucasian white, 24% were black African American, and 10% were Asian. And superhero movies at that time were not pulling in that kind of audience. It was mostly white people. And this was important for other studios to diagnose because they wanted to you know, figure out what this magic recipe was. Being inclusive was always important to this franchise. And you can see that pretty much from the start and especially in Too Fast, Too Furious. It's a franchise which has actually cultivated diverse talent behind the camera as well. The car world is diverse, so too should be any movie about the car world, don't you think? I'm okay with that. And oh, Universal is making a, a killing off of it. In fact, of the nine mainline movies, only one has been directed by a white man. Rob Cohen, of course, who helmed the original film way back in 2001. After that came John Singleton. And with each movie, as they added more diversity with inside the crew and within the cast, they started making more money. And the director most credited with the franchise's success remains Justin Lin, who elevated the series from mid-level Hollywood entertainment in the 2000s to a billion dollar phenomenon. Frankly, he stepped into the series when it was on the brink of going direct to video with Fast and the Furious Tokyo Drift, which was part three, and led it to new heights over an initial tenure, which lasted four films. For people in my age group who would like to see some sort of throwback to the series' of street racing roots, I know that Universal doesn't care about appealing to 50-year-old white men. I totally get it, and I'm not suggesting that they do it, but I just kind of hope that they would at one point. Universal knows their audience very well, and I respect that. However, given that it seems like they're out of ideas, because if they weren't, everybody would be agreeing. As this franchise wraps up, they're going to have to do something to bring the story full circle. What happened to Brian O'Connor? Where's he doing? Was he still babysitting? What's going on with that? So I'll bet dollars to donos that some sort of expanded street race sequence sets up at least a dovetail into the main story, even if it's nothing more than an homage to the OGs who gave this series popularity back in the early 2000s. But maybe I'm dreaming. And I only say this because Vin Diesel recently posted on Instagram that he felt that the series needs to go go back to its roots, whatever that means to him. <laughs> Sounds to me he was coming out of a very difficult script meeting. But what baffles me the most is that, that this team, the team including people like executive producer Neil Moritz, Vin Diesel, Justin Lin, and so many other people at the top who have been involved in the last several movies together have built a hugely successful franchise and I can't understand how Universal is just gonna let this lay, you know. 
I would think Universal would do anything that he could to keep this team together, even if it means an intervention on somebody's part. Maybe that's not the way it works in Hollywood. There's surely more going on behind the scenes and certainly more to the story, but I wouldn't care to speculate. Ultimately, I'm still a fan of the franchise. You know, it's part of who I am. And there's still tens of millions of people around the world who really love the franchise. So let's wait and see what happens. Whatever happens, I'll be there in their theater. Thanks for watching.